Hey everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. So let's go ahead and start with the questions. I, why fuck around at the top of the show? What, what is served by that? Um, the first question is from Melanade1972, uh, who asks, What are your thoughts concerning in Mendham's antinatalism views, or just antinatalism in particular? Good, I, I find it's nice to start with a nice light topic to begin with. You know, you don't want to get anything too heavy in right at the very beginning. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to call myself an antinatalist, but I am annoyed whenever people uh, treat attempts to seriously discuss population control or, or thinking about trying to lower the population in a responsible way as though uh, in order to believe that or advocate that you have to be a Nazi. Uh, population control, overpopulation is, is a real thing. It's a real, real serious issue in some parts of the world right now and it's becoming a more important issue here in the US as we continue to fuck and procreate like crazy, like there's no fucking tomorrow. Um, and I think it would be a good idea if we would start to look at ways of responsibly lowering the birth rate, not through forced sterilization, not through uh, you know a, a one-child policy like they have in China, not through anything mandatory but through voluntary stuff, through just encouraging people to maybe, you know, not have six or eight fucking kids. You know, just stop at one or two, really. Do you really need to throw that much of your DNA into the future? We're, we're, seriously, the, the, the human race will be fine with just one or two of your kids. We're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, so things like that, things like in, inverting the tax policy so that after you have one or two kids, let's say, uh, you don't get any more tax breaks, you don't get any more deductions for extra kids, that you actually have to pay more, assuming you can afford it with your income, uh, than less for having large families. And it doesn't pay uh, in terms of your tax burden uh, to have large families. That, that to me would make a lot of sense. Next one is from Firefly4F4 and he asks, as you work in the film industry, can you name some people alive or deceased in the industry, actor, director, etc., you would love to meet, and what would the meeting entail? Note, this doesn't just have to be people you like or admire. Well, it's going to be people that I like or admire, Andrew. You're just going to have to live with it, okay? Uh, and to say I work in the film industry uh, in a very, very peripheral sense. Uh, but, yeah, uh, good question. It would be Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin for me, I think, of the deceased people. I mean, assuming that the laws of space-time could be suspended to allow me to have such a meeting. I mean, I, I mentioned Buster Keaton in the last one of these. Someone asked what my favorite, uh, who my favorite film director was, and I said Buster Keaton. I think the guy is just a genius without peer. I mean, uh, the greatest filmmaker probably the greatest actor in the history of cinema for me, definitely in the history of American cinema, uh, an incredibly economical filmmaker, and, and not in terms of budgets, but in terms of composition, in terms of story, in terms of how he constructed his narratives, in terms of how he composed his frame, the frame of uh, a Buster Keaton film is a wonder to behold. Everything is in exactly where the place where it needs to be for the scene to work. And he knew exactly where to put the camera. And he was a great editor. And, and he was a great physical actor. And just Buster Keaton. Um, and also Charlie Chaplin, who is known as a great c comic, a great clown, a great actor, but is also underrated as a director as well. Just made some of the greatest films you'll ever see. I mean, God, City Lights, The Kid, uh, modern times, his great sound debut, The Great Dictator, uh, just goes on and on, you know. Uh, as far as living people in the industry that I'd like to meet, probably Werner Herzog. Uh, my favorite director, I would say he's the greatest living director right now. And just, uh, I mean, a, a great documentarian as well as a great uh, fiction filmmaker. And some would say that his documentaries are fiction films as well, which is one of the great things about them, I think. Um, just, yeah, Herzog, of, of, of living actors, directors, etc. He would be at the top of my list. I would love to meet him and pick his brain. And, and what would that meeting entail? Well, if Werner was up for it, it would entail me sucking his dick until he got sick of it.
Gavin Smith asks, are you a Nats or an O's fan? It doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference now, does it, Gavin? Uh, but I'm an O's fan. I was born an O's fan. I will die an O's fan. I'm an O's fan. Boar's Head Bill, my buddy Boar's Head Bill, uh, Doc Gregory. I had to ask, as you may know, CM Punk recently struck a fan in the crowd during the 10-8 episode of Raw. What did you think about it? Do you think it will carry a punishment? And how would you have handled it if you were in charge of the WWE? A wrestling question from Doc Gregory, wrestling referee extraordinaire. Um, yeah, CM Punk uh, <laughs> punched a fan or backhanded a fan uh, while he was out in the crowd doing a little piece of business with Vince McMahon uh, at the end of Raw a couple weeks ago. Look, I don't think the wrestlers should be hitting fans, but at the same time, and, and Doc and I actually discussed this in person last week, uh, you are told, as an attendee of the shows, before the show, not to fuck with the wrestlers. And especially if they are, you know, going into the crowd for something, uh, to, for t taking a brawl into the stands, or as Punk was doing, going into the stands to, to escape from John Cena and, and Ryback. And, you know, you're told, as a spectator, don't fuck with the wrestlers. I mean, I know everybody near ringside always tries to like high five them or reach out and touch them during the match uh that is sort of tolerated but this guy was like patting punk on the head and i think when punk actually went like that to hit him i think he actually wound up hitting the wrong guy but oops but look just don't fuck with the wrestlers just don't fuck with the wrestlers that's that's my opinion of it if if he's in the the crowd and it's live television and he's fucking trying to do a bit of business with with Vince McMahon like they're still they still have a little thing to do the show's not over yet uh, don't fuck with the wrestlers guys just don't fucking touch him just leave him alone let him do his job let him do what you paid your fucking crazy ticket price to come there and watch him do that's what I think uh, and I don't think he should be punished for it. I don't think Punk should be punished for it and I hope he's not I hope that he doesn't end up dropping the the title at the pay-per-view coming up soon uh, because he he punched out a fan I, I mean I really hope that he doesn't he isn't punished for it um, maybe they could punish him by turning him fucking back babyface like he's supposed to be 22 Steve 5150 asks do you think the political system in America would be better or worse if we instituted nationwide second choice voting I think it would be a lot better I am hugely in favor of uh, you call it second choice voting instant runoff voting is another name for it or the alternative vote I think it's a great system I wish we had it here as a standard uh, basically what that means is you instead of voting for one candidate uh, you actually rank your choices so let's say you vote for let's say you want to vote for Jill Stein in the presidential election so you vote for Jill Stein you make her your number one choice but then let's say uh, assuming that Jill Stein doesn't win I know, go figure. Uh, you might say, uh, make Barack Obama your second choice. And then the way they count them is, they count all the, the first choice votes first, and if no candidate wins a majority of the vote, then they count uh, the second choice votes of the candidate that had the, the lowest number of, of votes. In other words, they, they take the candidate that got the least number of votes in the first round and they, they, they eliminate them and then they count the second choice votes uh, for, for those ballots. And it's, it, it, number one, it, it, it makes sure that everyone's vote counts, that there's no, there's no way you can ever argue that, well, if you vote for a minor party candidate, you're throwing your vote away because you can make that candidate your number one choice and then you can also make your second choice for another candidate. Like your vote is going to get counted no matter what. Um, and also it, it requires that the winner of the vote have a true majority and not just the largest plurality. And I'm, I'm all in favor of instant runoff voting. I think it's a great, I have no idea why we have not instituted instant runoff voting across the board for our elections in the U.S. It's so far superior, uh, it, to my way of thinking than the, the first past the post system that we have now. Dingleberry Lick asks, how often do you jack off? every hour on the hour and actually just, just the great old ones asks how many of these videos 
will you make before you get nothing but questions about your penis and gay sex? I think I have about two left before the series just devolves completely into an exercise in inventing dick jokes. That's, that's what I think. Tyler Omega, how long into a relationship should I wait before farting in front of my girlfriend? You want to fart in front of her relatively early in the relationship, I think. Um, my philosophy is if you uh, fart in front of her and she comes back, then she's yours for life, and if you fart in front of her and she leaves, she was never yours to begin with. El Spoko, what do you think about Batman being nothing more than Ayn Rand's wet dream and Superman a one-dimensional character with no substance? The Batman thing I do see, uh, because Bruce Wayne, the, uh, the billionaire industrialist who uh, takes the law into his own hands and does the things that the system can't do. Uh, yeah, I, I see how you could definitely view Batman as like an objectivist hero. That's not how I see him, and uh, that's not how he's usually written, but I, I definitely see that the potential is there for that. Um, and if there were Batman writers who were more interested in politics and more interested in making social commentary with the character, I think that'd be a great idea for a Batman story. Maybe introduce that into the uh, the story. Have someone talk about Batman as though he is like uh, an Ayn Randian hero and then see how Bruce Wayne or Batman reacts to that. I think that would be really interesting. And as for Superman being a one-dimensional character with no substance, you just have not been reading the right uh, Superman stories, I think. Because uh, I think if you read Superman for all seasons, if you read um, All-Star Superman, if you read Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, uh, you read really, I mean, really good, what I would call good Superman stories. Um, I don't consider him a one-dimensional character at all. I think he's a really rich, deep character with a lot of potential. And it just, it depends with Batman and Superman both, and all comic book characters, all serialized characters in general. Uh, that have different creative teams in charge of them at various times. It all depends on who's writing it. It all depends on where the story is coming from. I mean, yeah, are there Superman stories where he has been flat and uh, one-dimensional? Yeah, sure. But I don't think that speaks for the character as a whole. Hey, that was the last question. Let's do a shout-out. Uh, the shout-out this week is to Bob Smearfack. God damn it. What a great fucking guy. Bob Smearfack. He does this uh, really, really hilarious series called Bob's Notes, where he examines, he, he offers these sort of illustrated summaries of uh, the New Testament. He's been going through the book of Matthew, and he's up to, I think, Matthew chapter 15 or so, and I, I, there's a link to uh, the playlist for Bob's Notes, which is just so funny and so insightful and just great, and if you're not watching Bob's Notes, you should be fucking, you should go right now and watch every single one of those, and subscribe to his channel. And also, Bob Smearfack made for me uh, a little while ago what is still by far the best shout out video I've ever gotten from anybody. It's just so funny and I, I linked to that one too. Uh, he made this just awesome shout out video for me and uh, I watched it just before I sat down to do this again and it's just so funny and I love that. It's one of my favorite YouTube videos um, and uh, I, I would recommend that one as well. But Bob Smearfact, subscribe to Bob Smearfact's motherfucking YouTube channel. What are you waiting for? Go subscribe to Bob Smearfact's YouTube channel. And that's it for this episode of You Had to Ask. If you have a question you would like me to answer for the next episode, leave a comment, ask your question, and maybe I'll answer it next time. If I don't answer it next time, it's probably because your question was boring and stupid. Thanks for watching. See you next time.